Ladies and gentlemen, one of the most fascinating events to follow is TSEC, the Top Chess Engine Championship, where some of the best engines play against one another. Uh, and the most recent season, season 22, just concluded with the Super Final, uh, with Stockfish 15 taking on Komodo Dragon 2894 or something along those lines. Basically, the way it works is that the computers play a pair against each other. So they play a game with white and a game with black in a designated opening variation. Uh, Stockfish did not lose a single pair. So that basically means that when it was on the defensive side, if it lost, it always won the revenge game. And if it drew from the defensive side, it always won the offensive game. Komodo was never able to defeat it. And in this video, I'm going to take you through five games that I have selected out of this sample size because uh, Stockfish won by a landslide uh, and the match was kind of over really already 70% of the way through, but they finished all the games. These games are just absolutely fascinating. I'm going to try to sort of integrate theory, um, but obviously they came with book. Uh, so this is game number 12, and as you can see, they get the honorary Grandmaster titles. Um, yeah, these games are just nothing short of incredible. So this uh, is game 12, and uh, Komodo drew, I think, uh, the previous game. They have a Knight of Sicilian, uh, and what's pre-programmed is Bishop E3, which is a main line, E6, which is the um, uh, Scheveningen, uh, probably mispronounced. G4 is not a popular move, uh, but it's still book. H6 obviously prevents G5. And Queen F3, although pre-programmed into the engine, is not a popular human move at all. I think it's like, this is the third most popular move in the position, and so is this. Uh, but up until this moment, uh, I think this is the final book move. So this was the pre-programmed position, very complicated Sicilian battle. Uh, Stockfish plays h4 with the intention of obviously playing g5 uh, in the future. Uh, Black responds with h5 uh, themselves. So they, they want to uh, make Stockfish go here and then plant this knight on g4. Uh, Bishop h3 played, uh, and Black plays the move knight d7. Now I think, if I'm not mistaken, this position had been reached in one game between Hoi Fan and Ana Ushinina in 2013 in the Women's World Championship. And I think Hoi Fan played the move G6 in that game, uh, if I'm not mistaken. But I believe uh, this game proceeded with long castles. So B5. I mean, just a very confrontational Sicilian. Uh, white has the option to take and win a pawn. The problem is that after you take, black will play knight e5. So black is not going to do that. Uh, black is going to not lose a pawn. So that obviously does not happen. Instead, Stockfish plays the move a3, preventing the move b4, and black plays knight e5, kicking the queen. So now that so Stockfish has sidestepped, the idea is to play f4. But then the idea most likely is to blow Komodo off the board by just launching all the pawns forward, right? So we have f4, the knight goes to c4. Now we take the knight because our intention is not necessarily to take because of this, but our intention is to sort of cut the attack before it begins. So f5, there it is, right? So we're looking at this, we're looking at this, you know, rook is gonna come on the open file afterward. Black plays queen b7, sidestepping on the, the queen diagonal and kind of lining up intentions this way and also here. And Stockfish plays king b1, always just a decent move to kind of uh, slide the king over, although admittedly b4 looks absolutely terrifying from the human standpoint. Uh, Stockfish just takes it. Black plays queen takes b4. Shockingly, Stockfish does not blunder made in one move. We have a5, and I mean, it, this looks awful for white, right? Like, you're looking at this, you're like, this looks terrible. a4, and the game is literally over. Well, Stockfish plays bishop d4, attacking the rook, and uh, Komodo moves it. Again, if you play a4 here, looks like this is going to work. I sidestep, I attack your queen, and now my bishop actually defends and attacks at the same time. Then I trade your knight off. So Stockfish is going to use the double backwards knight jutsu to trade off and, and be completely fine. So for that reason, Komodo has to deal with the initiative. And look at this move, bishop c5. This is absolutely savage. If you take this bishop like this, then queen c7 and you get mated before I do. If you play bishop e7, uh, I have check and I pick up your rook. Uh, and apparently I even have this first. Stockfish is saying that this is first even stronger. So uh, you can't even take my bishop. So... Komodo gets pushed back here, right? And, uh, but, but the attack continues. I mean, Komodo kind of regroups and goes for a second wave of the attack, but Stockfish right there, kicking out the knight. The pawn is still coming. Stockfish is like, so what? So what? I'm the one that's going to end up in the Gotham YouTube video. 
Oftentimes in these games, there's like very obscure maneuvering. So I'm not going to like, you know, talk about every single little maneuvering uh, approach here. I'm going to kind of give you a big picture. Obviously, Komodo is still doing what you do in a Sicilian, which is attack on the queen side. Stockfish neutralizes the attack and now begins moving the pawns forward itself. So c4, king a1, hiding the king in the corner, f6. This right here is vintage Stockfish. Uh, although vintage gen genuinely means turning, uh, generally means turning back the clock. Stockfish is at its peak. Uh, now the black pieces have been completely restricted. So the bishop, the dark skirt bishop, the rook, uh, and therefore the king also are completely restricted. Uh, and Stockfish puts this game away by uh, reconsolidating and basically just saying, I have more pieces than you. So at some point, there's going to be a tipping point in the position. Uh, you, literally, I mean, I just have more pieces playing. Your dark scored bishop is not playing. I'm removing your knight from the game. Step one. Now I'm going to win that G pawn. All right, you can take on H4, but it's not going to do you any good. And uh, again, a little bit of maneuvering here. It's like very professional type of behavior by Stockfish. I'm not going to go into every single one of these moves. Stockfish very, very, very slowly prepares uh, the infiltration. Like D6 is now completely overwhelmed. Uh, this bishop on E1 protects this, so this rook can't come in. I mean, it's just unbelievable. <laughs> and uh, yeah, the avalanche therefore ends up just... And th they play till mate, which is really funny. So even though there's a 13-point material advantage, uh, the, the, you know, the, yeah, queen sack, and then rook d1, and then knight g7. I think Stockfish always tries to find the prettiest checkmate. So this game was a crazy Sicilian battle, but somehow... Constantly in the Sicilian battle, Stockfish gets the better uh, of Komodo. If Stockfish ever loses, it's be basically because the opening battle was already like on the very, very, very bad side of things. So uh, we're skipping ahead to the 30th, 30-ish games. I think maybe th game 30 this is. Um, this, this one is a D4 opening uh, and a King's Indian defense. So the King's Indian is virtually refuted at engine level. Uh, now, the only thing is, can Stockfish defend the black side? Uh, more often than not, no, but sometimes it does. In this game, we had a same-ish King's Indian. So this is a, a King's Indian with f3, bishop e3, queen d2, uh, preventing knight g4, looking at this and looking at this. Um, a6 and actually long castle. So generally speaking, uh, if white castle short in a King's Indian, then black gets to play e5, f5. When that doesn't happen, we have totally unique stuff. So here, Komodo plays b5, trying to get cb5, ab5 on the board to try to activate this. Uh, that is very much not Stockfish's style. Stockfish's style is to play e5, attacking in the middle of the board. Uh, b4 now. So if this had happened, then probably here Stockfish would have played h4, or Stockfish would have played c5 to try to get a position that looks like this, where you just restrict the enemy movement, like c6, f4. This is very Stockfish-esque position just basically not allowing any of the pieces to go. Uh, but Komodo plays b4, so we get knight a4. Again, Stockfish is very reluctant to allow opponent counterplay, uh, and also this is just bad. Uh, so it plays knight a4, knight e8, and there's c5. So I, I, I just mentioned this kind of idea, just sort of encroaching on the position, really not allowing the opponent to move, uh, pushing the opponent toward only one sort of certain type of uh, side of the board, and now f4. I mean, just a beautiful lockdown here on the center. Uh, bishop d5 and knight f3, just simple development. b3, not afraid to push the pawns in front of the king. I don't even know what queen c2 does. I guess you're trying to play bishop c4 and maybe, I don't know, maybe long-term pressure on the c-file. Knight c7, h4. There it is. Okay, so obviously this is also an idea. Will black play h5 and weaken the structure? Will black allow h5? We have our answer. And uh, yeah, a lot of things are coming true here. Knight g5, planting the knight in, and now bishop takes, knight takes, rook e1, and uh, yeah, I'm really not sure where white is going to break through. I mean, it looks like Komodo has kind of created a fortress, but this is oh, king d2, bishop f2, <laughs> walk the king out. Uh, yeah, fortress breaking is always fascinating. Uh, sometimes you just blow your opponent off the board. Other times, look, you try to sacrifice material, um, and, uh, you try to get a position that looks like this, but this is just a good fortress for black. Like, black actually defends everything, so, uh, sacrificing the rook for the purpose of the fortress. Uh, Stockfish does end up taking it, uh, but it's still not clear how to break through. So let's watch. Let's watch how Stockfish tries to find a way through. Basically, at some point, it gets fed up and it risks something, 
and it basically evaluates that something is winning. Obviously, there is just shuffling going on, uh, so there's not too much to learn from here. Finally, it decides to take the knight, right? It didn't do that for a while because it evaluated this as also a fortress. However, it's anything but a fortress because you play the move e6, but how do you get in now? Rook e1, queen c2, king g2, right? Where, where's the, how are we going to get out of this? Where are, where's the ability to break this fortress down? Ah, oh, a3, okay. A little queen side break, and there's a5 falling. So this fortress was broken down uh, as we sort of retreat like 40 moves back with a knight trade, a clearance move, which is the move e6, and then the second that black was stretched a little bit too thin, uh, you play the move a3. So pawn breaking their way into the position, winning a pawn, and uh, I mean, it's never too late to win another pawn. Rook e5. I believe this game is just honestly absolutely ruthless. Like once Stockfish finally makes its way through, uh, it plays b5 again, like slowly prying away the defenses, pass pawn here. And has Komodo really moved any pieces in 50 moves? No. I think Stockfish is a bit of a sadist. Promotes to a rook. <clears throat> I think when Stockfish is promoting a queen or a rook and it's going to get captured, it always promotes to a rook. It's just a rook up and uh, it goes for mate and uh, mate is achieved slowly but surely with queen e7, fg, and queen f6. It took like 100 moves, literally. Stockfish won the game on the 100th move. It, it under-promoted to a rook. I mean, it's just basically toying with a 3600 level computer. It's kind of disgusting. Uh, very nice, though. I mean, very interesting. Like, all the way back from the beginning, just very methodically suffocating the King's Indian play. You know, normally the King's Indian uh, is, is uh, like, the, the key moves are e5, c5. Well, what happens when white has pawns on e5? Like... You have literally two game plans in the King's Indian, and you are unable to achieve either of them. That's what Stockfish does. We jump ahead now about 20, 20 or 30 more games. Uh, this one was a very obscure opening. So this is like a old Indian defense. I don't know where... I think they left book on move five. So this is like very early uh, departure uh, from theory. Obviously, white is a bit more active on the queen side. Has a very traditional setup here. But listen, back in the day, Black always played this if Black wanted to win. You know, not always, but I'm saying like Black plays a little bit of an imbalanced opening. So Stockfish takes the full center, uh, develops, uh, and plays knight d2. Very interesting move. So normally you would think just go d5 here and then, you know, accept this. But Stockfish like, no, your bishop is dumb now. I don't really care that you can take in the center and I have to move my dark squared bishop out. So what? Uh, your position is terrible. And uh, I'm going to move my queen out of the pin. You're going to play d5. And here is perhaps the most already savage moment of the game, as we have takes, takes, e5, kicking the knight out to the side of the board. Here, if you ask a human what to do, human will play like bishop b5, castle, castle. I mean, human will just like try to castle, right? Stockfish plays queen d3, which is a move I don't understand whatsoever. But the idea is to go here and prevent this. So prevent knight f4 and try to trap the knight. So knight f4 is played. Walking into this. And Stockfish, with a straight face, plays the move. King d1. And ba like, computers get into positions that look absurdly dumb, but they always have a really good move. And now here comes g3. Here comes f4. Here comes my pawn wall. Here comes the pawn assault. I'm going to play... Uh, I'm waiting for the move. Waiting for the move. Takes... So I'm going to remove, I'm going to trade the bishop for the knight and give you a pawn there so it's tough for you to move. And then I'm going to play this move and now you have no play. Then I play knight b5, which attacks your queen and you can't take. And then I plop my knight into d6 and black is so restricted. Just so restricted. It doesn't matter that the king is on d1. And really now the question is, where is Stockfish going to win this game? Is Stockfish going to play h4, h5? Is Stockfish going to suffocate the queen side and then try to like trade and then, you know, do, some, do something over there? Uh, rook f3 is kind of a multi-purpose move. You see Komodo trying to fight back on the queen side with the active line. Oh, there's king e1. Our famous uh, Stockfish uh, king walk, right? Knight c5 trading off another piece that's good in close positions, leaving black with two pieces that are absolutely terrible in close positions. Um, queen a2, giving up a pawn. So Stockfish in the middle of this game just loses a pawn. Just clean pawn down, plays the move b4, and even tries to trade queens. Tries to trade queens, 
in a pawn down position and argue that in the long run, I am going to beat you to death with the lack of space. I mean, this is the time. Stockfish can beat you in tactical shootouts. It can also squeeze you to death with gloves on and there will be no fingerprints left at the crime scene. All right, like, you don't even know what you're going to play here with black. Like, if you think you're going to play bishop f8 and remove this, okay, and, and, like, what's the game plan once I have a passed pawn and I go here, right? h4, so you can't take me. So, uh, Komodo doesn't trade queens, and actually, I, I, and then, well, now here comes the king walk, right? The famous Stockfish king walk. The clearance sacrifice here, sacrificing a pawn to activate the bishop. Stockfish doesn't even take it with the queen or the bishop. It takes it with the rook. Rook d3, no, you can't touch me. All right, let's trade queens again. All right, now it's time, but you should have traded queens several moves ago when you weren't down a pawn. I think Stockfish just understands, like, endgame transitions a little bit better than its counterpart. And, um, well, what you're about to watch is, is the final plan in action, right? I mean, the king dances around ED to create the permanent threat of a pass pawn. Now we check, and we put the bishop here. The bishop is more active on the e5 square than on the c5 square, because here there's a constant threat of, you know, controlling b8. Uh, rook c5, bishop f6, bishop e7. Asking a very uncomfortable question of, do you want to sacrifice your rook? If you do, my two rooks will be your rook and bishop. So rook e7. Again, if king g7, I'm gonna play here, I'm gonna walk my king in, like literally, the, the tipping point of this position will be this, uh, this, this, <laughs> this, like I'm just gonna walk in and take everything. So um, rather than doing that, Komodo tries to defend Rook and Bishop, but this is just completely unholdable as now you, you play F5, splitting the black pawns, F and H now, then you play Rook F6, and uh, you transition this into a completely winning rook endgame at the right moment uh, by either sacrificing a rook for a bishop or just continually knocking down the pawns. So the pawns fall down on both sides. The, the two rooks just cannot be defended with a rook and a bishop. So Stockfish correctly, I mean, you don't need me to tell you it was correct, plays the move f5, splitting apart the black pawns. And black just has four pawn islands, and they're all going to get hunted down and, and taken. So... Uh, HFCA, and uh, yeah, well, one by one they fell, you know, they were picked off. Uh, first we have the F pawn being traded, we have the A pawn being won, the C pawn being won, and uh, you could go for the H pawn, but you can also just go make a queen. And I think Stockfish promotes to a rook? Oh wait, no, never mind. I was really hoping Stockfish would make another rook, instead Stockfish just delivers. Actually, here, uh, Black resigned. <clears throat> So that's kind of funny. Black uh, did not get mated, although it was made in several moves. So, um, yeah, I mean, you bas so basically against uh, Stockfish, uh, you cannot play obscure, like, old Indian defenses. Like, you, you absolutely have to play main lines. Um, computers will win this about 80 to 90% of the time. Uh, and I, I'm very curious to know if... Uh, yeah, I, I, I think this is game number 68. I, I really wonder if Komodo was able to win this game. Um, but, uh, let, let, let me check before I move on. So it's very, you know, it's very interesting to, to like see which, uh, which pairs were able to be won. So no, Komodo drew, like Komodo drew this starting position with white when Stockfish had black. So Komodo was not able to win. Yeah. All right. Let's jump ahead to game number four. Uh, in this game, we go back to E4 and we have a French defense. So the French is virtually refuted at engine level. Uh, I mean, white is winning an unbelievable amount of times. Um, d4, d5, and we have a Winauer, but we have a sideline. So the Petrosian variation <laughs> uh, with queen d7, not the modern Petrosian, I think the older Petrosian uh, from the, uh, the 20th century. Um, the idea here is very fascinating of queen d7. Basically, black trades the bishop and then plays b6. And theory here goes queen g4, f5, defending the g7 pawn, and in many, many positions, uh, the bishop actually got traded. So uh, white has a space advantage, but black has a very, very good defense of basically everything. And then we'll try to play like c5, maybe attack over here. The queen likes to venture out and tries to pressure stuff. So complicated position. Bishop b7, a4, and the last theoretical move is knight c6. So white is better because of the bishop pair and slightly more space. Is white better enough to win? Well, I don't know. I'm featuring this game in the video, so probably. Bishop a3 is a beautiful move. However, black can really deal with the fact that this is a very powerful diagonal by just ignoring the bishop, like not really putting anything there. So knight h6, uh, knight h3, and castling long. 
So now the bishop is not too significant, right? But opposite side castling means a couple of things. Probably we're going to get an opposite side attack, right? So uh, let's see what happens. Rook g8, bishop b4, trying to play a5. I'm actually so curious why this move was not played. Like, that would absolutely be my first instinct. Just not allow g5. Knight f7 looks very good. Uh, Stockfish seems to think inducing g5 is better. It actually evaluates this attack as completely good for itself because it's getting that juicy f6 square. And even though, I mean, this is going to happen. Stockfish is like, so what? I'm not even castled, bro. Like, who are you attacking? You know what I mean? Straight up. Like, there's nothing there. Right? So, okay. And? So what? Now I'm attacking on two sides of the board and I have the center locked. When the center is locked, it's easy to isolate a, a position and attack it. But when the center is locked and you have the ability to attack two sides, your opponent is dead. I mean, even if it's 3600. So h3, it now takes a moment to address the attack and force black to commit to something. So now Komodo has been forced to sack a pawn. All right, because it overextended. Knight f5, and now Stockfish is like, all right, queen f4, let's bring in my light squared bishop. Now that move does win a pawn. Cd4, knight b4. Stockfish is like, so what? Go, go back. Get out of here. Uh, if you play a5, I'm actually very happy because I have bishop h5. So you have, to, uh, you have to deal with that. c5 is an interesting move. Queen e7 here, I'm fascinated why it wasn't played. It unpins the rook and defends the knight. Why would you not do that? I don't know. That's why I'm the human and they're the robots. Uh, and by the way, this move looks like it wins material. Stockfish doesn't play it. Instead plays a5. But the craziest thing is they know the best moves. I don't know the best moves. Why is bishop h5 winning material not the best move? I don't know. I guess in the long run, Stockfish thinks that this bishop is worth more than this rook. Isn't that incredible? It actually sees so far into the future, it deems the rook on g6 not worth as much as the bishop. It thinks that its chances of winning the game are higher if it doesn't go and win this material after c5. That's ludicrous. So a5, knight back, and now a6. So it attacks and it doesn't even open the file for the rook. I mean, traditional knowledge tells you you gotta open the rook. Nope. Stockfish restricts the light squared bishop back to a8. We've seen this before. And it's still not going for bishop h5. And it's still allowing bishop h5. Obviously, there's a fork here, so you have to address it. And now h4. I mean, Stockfish literally just leaves its king in the middle and pushes its flank pawns to the max. I mean, I guess this is just how you win games now, folks. You just got to push your h and a pawns, and if they both get to the sixth rank, probably you're going to win. King f1. All right, we're not hanging a fork. But now what? This, is, th this to me, is always the most fascinating thing. How is Stockfish going to win the game now? Right? N now there's three sides of the battle. The center is about to fall apart as well. King b6. Bishop back to d1, c4, now we pick this up. And Stockfish is going to break through on that side of the board while black is stuck kind of dealing with the pressure over here. Sometimes you don't even fully understand how Stockfish wins games. Like, it's just incredible. I mean, look, the h-pawn has made it all the way. The rook is going to get extracted, right? So now you have to sacrifice. Black's major point of counterplay here is the c-pawn, uh, and uh, Stockfish is just unconcerned. I mean, like, look at these moves. Rook g4, knight h... What? Now we bring back the knight, queen trade, and um, Stockfish just simplifies down. I mean, Stockfish has a rook up. It's going to win. Uh, and uh, it does. It takes a little bit of time. I said the, 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 the engines don't resign. They, tr they actually defend perfectly. The problem is that one side has an extra rook, uh, and that side delivers a checkmate with rook b3, rook b1, and knight c4. So what happened? <laughs> like... Honestly, what happened in this game? Um, if we scroll back like 40 moves, uh, the engine was only slightly better here, but once h6 got played, and um, yeah, king c7 was just too slow, I guess. Uh, it allowed Stockfish to trade off the rook and control the other rook from coming in, isolate the h-pawn, and just win it. And if you play rook h8, this rook is just paralyzed for the whole game. Not to mention I can still go win the pawn. So, I mean, I guess where Komodo lost this game was h6. But if it doesn't play h6 and instead plays king c7, Stockfish will go here and still win. So, <laughs> I don't know. I honestly don't know. So, it's, it, really, this is a museum exhibit. Okay, that's really what this is. I, I don't know. Or like staring into outer space. I don't just...
you know, it, it, it's incredible. It's honestly incredible. It just melts the black position, completely melts it. Um, the final game that I have for you, uh, we go back to a Sicilian defense. Uh, this one, a Dragon Sicilian, which I also think is refuted at engine level. Um, I think this is game number 80, so before we do that, uh, th the position was so bad that Komodo won, actually. So Komodo was able to win uh, the game it had with White, and this is a, um, a sideline of the Dragon Sicilian where, uh, actually it's a Dragondorf, a Dragdorf, because basically Black plays the Dragon, but now also plays the Nightorf, so I don't know if you're, if you're, if you're following. Like, oops, sorry, this is the uh, Nidorf, uh, but uh, this is the Dragondorf. So it combines the two. So the Dragdorf is, or Dragondorf is, uh, is I think, refuted also at engine level, but I feel like I'm a broken record at this point. Um, Long Castles, B4, and we already know how Stockfish deals with this, right? In fact, many of us can learn how to deal with this, the, this queenside attack, right? So Knight A4, Knight E5. Um, last time we were here, there was a pawn here, a pawn here. So how does Stockfish do it with a more fluid pawn structure? A pawn structure that hasn't moved yet. It takes the pawn. It opens the position for black, flips it off, like its hat. Parents, you flips off the hat. Uh, and, uh, you know, bishop d7. And it's like, okay, how are you gonna attack me? I'm gonna attack you. h3, f4, or h4, h5. Here we go. Rook b8, queen a3, bishop b5. Trying to sack another pawn, by the way. Like, if you do the math, that is another pawn. So if you're just like, yeah. Now, again, to a human, you know, queen d7, rook fc8, the knights are gonna jump out of the way, the bishop is gonna get active. This is kind of, this is kind of scary. In fact, there is already a tactic here. Knight takes f3. And if you play, oh, okay, well, I mean, if you take it, then there's rook b5. I'm, black is only down one pawn, and uh, black is better. Like, literally, black is better even though white is up a pawn because uh, of something like this. And black just goes here and here and knight c5 and every major piece is in the attack. So, although we think two pawns is winning, no, not always. Bishop a7, knight goes back to e5, and Stockfish picks up the rook for the bishop as Komodo is basically arguing that there is an attack brewing. And here, uh, yeah, I mean, rook d4 is just obscene um it makes no sense visually like you guard this but you're what when the knights move the rook is going to be under attack so where is the rook going to b4 to defend the pawn from the front and attack and try to counter attack the queen black plays queen c8 knight back to c3 white is defending the, the pawns with the pieces it's supposed to be the other way the pawns are supposed to be in front of the pieces why is the heavy artillery defending the minions? Just Stockfish things. Knight e5. And now what Stockfish desperately wants is either a transition to an endgame, which is why it actually volunteers a queen trade, even though, of course, it would come with the winning of a pawn. It gives up everything over there. And what's going to decide this game is this, okay? Stockfish no longer can create a kingside attack because Black's king is incredibly solid. But what Stockfish can do is outmaneuver its counterpart in the, in the kind of journey down to an endgame as these pawns are gonna come forward. Knight f2, rook e1, here comes f5. Pawn takes f5, rook takes f5. Knight back to e3 attacking the rook. Now what? Knight back to f1? I mean, this is honestly like rook b3. By the way, did you notice that both queens were hanging when knight f1 was played? No, you didn't because I didn't either. Rook b3 hits both. Rook back to f4, and now queen d6. So white is up a pawn and an exchange. Stockfish has a three-point material advantage, but after the move knight e4, the eval is only plus one-ish. Plus one-ish. And, uh, you know, white has to find only moves, but white is 36-17. I think actually only move was queen c7 or, or, or uh, queen d1. My browser-based Stockfish is showing queen c7, but this one is like industrial powered, so I'm sure queen d1 is even stronger. Notice how Stockfish just sometimes knows when to admit defeat, like knows when to like roll over on its back, let you pet its tummy. Sorry, just puppy references. And is like, all right, I'm gonna play really passively, but you have nothing. Knight f3, if you're ever wondering why h4 is not being played, it's because white wins the race. h3, uh, a5, and like white is unconcerned about this h2 because you will just sack. It doesn't matter, rook h1 is there. So, um, 
Knight f3, rook takes. So Stockfish sacrifices the rook and, and to win this one. Rook f1, rook back to e1, rook back to f6. It's, it's basically saying that this endgame, despite the opposite colored bishops, will be winning. Or at least not a draw. I mean, it's, or like, like it's going to be incredibly difficult for black to draw it. That's basically what it's going to mean. Which is... Um, so, uh, you know, this is... Uh, I mean, that's bold. So rook back to f6. And now, here comes the last stage of the game, which is the constant threat of trades. And Komodo saying, I don't want a queen trade. Rook e2... White's king doesn't even march to the A-file. It marches to the middle because it's safer there. And it still allows you to push the A-pawn. Now we finally trade queens. And uh, you know what's going to win you the games. It's the pawns. So the pawns here are controlled. Three is better than two. And the wave begins. The pawns are blockaded. And the rook is put in prison. And the very brutal conclusion of this game involves all three pawns walking, the rook being trapped, sacrificing itself, and Stockfish once again, with a sense of humor, would have most likely promoted here to a rook. But I mean, really the striking visual of this game is this position, when, you know, the move a6 appears. Like that is what Stockfish does to Komodo, but if you go back through, throughout this game, which was just an, an on, like a complete mystery, Stockfish accepted the offerings on the queen side, opened up the entire position for black, proceeded to plop its rook straight into the diagonal, and then block its pawns with its pieces, move everybody to the queen side, clear out that side of the board, and then look at this defense. Like, Stockfish knows the art of moving forward, moving forward, and then moving back. Moving just everybody back. Everybody back to the first rank to consolidate, sacrificing the rook, picking up the two pieces, and uh, th just knows which straights to make. Just understands that three is going to beat two more often than not all the time. So, yeah, um, I think as we're speaking, they are wrapping up their final game. Uh, no, they're done. I think they literally just played their hundredth game. Stockfish won fifty nine and a half to forty and a half, and did not lose a single pair. It either drew two games won both games, or won and Komodo lost. So Stockfish is the champion of T-Sex Super Final 22. It is by far the strongest engine in the world. And it's only fitting that it's from Norway. Let me know if you want more engine content, uh, and uh, I'll see you in the next video. Get out of here.